and in composites uh, um, sustainability. He now holds this joint position between Bristol Composite Institute and the National Composite Center, where he's working on the application and maturing of technology, such as the Hyperdiff, that he's now going to tell us about. Ian, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Hyperdiff as a new route to produce sustainable composites. Uh, you'll see a lot of links with uh, much of the work that Tia has already mentioned in that um, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about um, contains some material prepared um, in collaboration with Dr. Marco Longana, and you'll see much of the work that um, uh, has been prepared and produced by the research team working with Hyperdiff. So what is Hyperdiff? Well, I, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. This is a very much a sort of a thumbnail uh, sketch and a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a background about uh, Hyperdiff's brief history, which has been going now since around 2010. Uh, it was initially uh, developed within uh, an EPSRC programme grant, a £6.5 million pound grant led by Bristol in collaboration with uh, uh, Imperial College London. Um, it was actually to originally improve ductility in composite performance. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, once said to make composites fail more gracefully in tension. And uh, the, the idea of putting together uh, composites with aligned discontinuous fibres was kind of the background. It was co-invented by Dr. Hannah Yu, as you can see here in the, in the image, with, uh, who is now at the University of Bath, and Professor Kevin Potter. Uh, a patented process, uh, patented by the University of Bristol. Um, we, we jumped forward from about 2012 to 2017. Uh, I was uh, lucky to lead a, a grant with, um, uh, with, with colleagues to pull together a million pound to scale up the Hyperdiff process, um, which has subsequently been the establishment, uh, the subject of a spin out, Lineac Composites, and we're going to bring all that together uh, through, this, um, through this talk. Now you can see here the, the basis for um, Hyperdiff. This excellent, uh, very elegant uh, simulation, smooth particle hydrodynamics simulation by uh, Dr. Sam Huntley, who was a postdoc on the project. This gives you an idea of how it functions. Uh, the real sort of business end of Hyperdiff is taking short discontinuous fibers, um, dispersing them in a low viscosity fluid. In our case, we, we disperse them in water and spraying them between parallel plates. You can see the plates here You'll get in this simulation. You'll see them more, more clearly later. But the idea is that the water is, um, carries the fibres, they hit the back plates um, and are rotated as they lose momentum uh, between the plates. The plates prevent them from moving laterally too much. And this means that as the water is drawn, uh, drawn down and uh, drawn out by uh, suction, then the fibres essentially collect on the bottom. Now, this is actually a moving um, conveyor belt, which means that you end up with an, uh, an aligned highly aligned fibre tape, which is then available um, as a dry fibre tape to uh, impregnate with a range of different matrices. So this is the kind of early days, uh, going back at the uh, very start of the, uh, the project within a hyperduct. Um, it, as you can see, it's very much a TRL, low TRL activity. Here's a, a bird's eye view of baby diff, the first generation of hyperdiff, which you now know as baby diff. This is very small sort of, um, you can see the, uh, the scale bar here, it's a very small footprint. Fibers were suspended in a tam tank, pumped with peristaltic pumps along uh, these uh, tubes, and then basically projected between the, the heads. And you can see here, parallel plates with spacers to uh, control the, um, the ability of the uh, fibers to undergo alignment, but a very, very small sort of activity. Very, very successful. Um, the aligned discontinuous fiber composites that arose from that activity, as you can see, produced uh, very high degrees of uh, uh, very high fiber volume fractions, around 55%. And correspondingly, you can see these um, uh, illustrated in these micrographs with the uh, white um, images here, these pale images depicting the fibers um, and then on here. But though that, that very high degree of alignment and indeed high uh, packing of the uh, laminates led to um, correspondingly high mechanical properties, as you can see a modulus of around 115 gigapascals and ultimate failure strengths of about 1500 megapascals. So a very encouraging start and one which indicated that this had some real, uh, real potential 
but on this scale it had to be um, enlarged to en enable laminates to be to be made and tested and so we come on to the the second kind of stage within uh, Hyperduct, the development and build, uh, construction of a, of a larger second generation machine that's still in existence. Uh, it's had the head upgraded. Now we call this two and a half generation, two and a half G machine. But this is um, still in existence in the basement of uh, Queen's building in the Faculty of Engineering. And we still use this for materials development. And we're starting out to see whether we have a new material or fiber combination. We try it out on this machine, which produces um, aligned tapes of around, um, uh, essentially about five, uh, five millimeter width tapes. So very, very narrow, but enough to show whether this is, um, has potential. But of course, uh, you can see this is a very, um, very, uh, very manual affair. You switch on at the, uh, on the wall and the, the, uh, the, the water reservoir, the dispersion tanks are here, the, uh, this octopus of a distribution system here through the manifold, the, the alignment head is here, and the tapes are then aligned and produced here. It's important to say at this stage that it's a material agnostic process. So the fiber lengths range from anything from a, a millimeter up to around 12 millimeters, and those are governed largely by the spacing of the, uh, of the uh, of the plates in the head to determine how well the alignment takes place. Um, we have tried over the course of uh, the uh, time span of uh, Hyperdiff a number of synthetic fibers, different forms of carbon, glass, Kevlar, uh, basalt, so a lot of um, uh, either synthetic polymer or modified inorganic materials. Uh, we've done a lot of work on reclaimed carbon fibers, principally on polyacrylonitrile, pan-based materials, but also pitch and a variety of natural fibers, typically different forms of cellulosic fibers, um, most commonly flax, but as you can see, jute and Korea are also being explored here. We're also able to look at a range of matrices. We started out um, looking at uh, thermosets with epoxies and uh, a large body of work in that area, but we've uh, subsequently moved on to thermoplastics, uh, range of thermoplastics, and latterly covalent adaptive network polymers, commonly known as vitromers. These are essentially materials which sit somewhere between thermosets and thermoplastics, it can be processed as thermoplastics, they form cross links, but not covalent cross links, um, electrostatic interactions, they can be heated, dissociated, the bonds can break, they can be re reprocessed, they cool, the bonds reform. So these are, you know, the, towards the ultimate form of reprocessable thermosetting type materials. We can also modify the material still further if we want to put in dispersion agents, sizing agents, if, if we require in the process. Um, Tia uh, mentioned about circular economy, and this is where Hyperdiff sits within that sort of process. So the Hyperdiff process can take typically reclaimed or production waste fibers. Um, so we can do these as, as we'd say, sort of uh, first, first reclamation fibers for a variety of different methods. We do the alignment. The impregnation with the matrix can be with a thermoset or could be with our vitrimers or thermoplastics. Composites are produced, they go through an, oper uh, an operational life. The constituents can be reclaimed and depending on which route we're taking, uh, if we're using a thermoset, then obviously we remove the thermoset matrix. We recover the fibers, the refibers can come back into the process. If we are using vitrimers or thermoplastics, we have the potential for a number of loops. And we've demonstrated that closed loop recycling can be used with thermoplastics, for example, where we repeat, repeatedly use Hyperdiff to align the fibers and make a tape. We produce the composite, we dissociate the fibers from the matrix, we reintroduce the matrix as a film, we re reclaim the fibers, we produce a, a truly second life composite, and we can do this four, five, six times. So what this has enabled us to do is to produce a, a series of um, uh, Research highlights the stiffest recycled carbon fiber composite, some 70 gigapascals that you can see here. The stronger, strongest composite produced from manufacturing waste, right, 800 megapascals. The potential to produce 100% recyclable high performance thermoplastic composites. You can see a, an example here using polypropylene, but this has been explored using polypropylene and uh, nylon six. And you can see the repeated recycling here. This, this is the first. Uh, composite, um, a slight drop in modulus um, as you produce the 
first life, first recycled composite. But then the materials start to recover their properties. Uh, a little bit surprising to us initially, but we found that uh, uh, microscopy reveals that uh, when the fibers are recovered, a very light dusting of particulate polymer remains on the fibers. And so this essentially self-sizes the fiber, gives us an opportunity to improve the interfacial uh, properties and the, uh, and the interface. And uh, the capability, the, the ability to process non-refined waste. So fiber lengths coming in with distributions from three to six millimeters, the machine is capable of, manu of, of manufacturing materials from that mixed, mixed waste, that mixed bed of fiber. So looking back at the original uh, reasoning behind this, this is the example of the pseudoductile behavior that we see in uh, those uh, hyperdiff materials. Uh, the top here, you can see that we have um, a combination of unidirectional laminates at the top and quasi-isotropic materials at the bottom. Uh, the green plot is one in which we have two forms of carbon, pitch and pan. And uh, in red, we have e-glass and pan fibers. And you can see the, the pronounced knee that uh, we see here, which gives us that pseudoductile response before the materials start to rise and then ultimately undergo failure. So this gives us an indication of kind of metal-like performance which um, removes that initial concern about knowing that the composite is strong, but not knowing quite when it's basically prone to fail. We've also looked at functionalization, and this is a, an example here of a functionalized composite where we are uh, tailoring for noise, vibration, and, and harshness. So improving, increasing the, uh, the flax content in a recycled carbon fiber composite enables us to improve and mod modify damping. So this brings us on to uh, the third generation machine. Now this was the subject of the uh, EPSRC proposal in 2017. And it, this shifted us up the TRL scale significantly. Now to give you some sort of idea of context, uh, this is a four meter long fully modular machine. As you can see, it's uh, sitting in essentially three cabinets. We now have an electronics cabinet sitting up here. So we, we have a um, a semi-automated machine that uh, is computer controlled. We have the pumps and the reservoirs sitting in this first cabinet. We have the alignment head in the second cabinet, and we have the um, uh, integration with the polymer film sitting on this first cartridge, going through three uh, heat sets of heats and roller presses. Uh, the, the ovens can go up to 400 degrees, so we can uh, handle uh, higher performance thermoplastics, and then that deposits the prepreg on the cassette. So it's a, a bit of a, a large beast in operation. This is a, an indication of how it's happening. Um, apologies for the slightly shaky hand on the film. So the sonication here is uh, essentially uh, distributing the fibers. You can see them here in the, uh, in the reservoirs uh, being agitated. They're now pumped up through this uh, Myriad pipe system going into the head. So the head is now sort of um, jetting those fibers through the alignment process. You can just see uh, the alignment uh, at this level here. These are the uh, separation of the heads and you can see the fibers being produced on this moving conveyor. So we're going through the uh, heat, uh, the initial heater to dry this tape. This is now a dry aligned tape. Uh, we then go on through into the roller system. Here is the polymer film being brought down. Uh, this is now being pressed onto the uh, from the pre break going through the heating and roller system. And then what's being deposited at the other end uh, essentially is the pre break system at the end. So what does this enable us to do? Well, this gives us the opportunity to produce um, essentially a range of different composites. So in this first instance, this is a high performance material using um, a state of the art uh, commercial thermoplastic toughened epoxy resin. Um, this gives us a material with, as you can see, uh, a much higher uh, fiber volume fraction, not as high as the first uh, very, very small sort of system, but we're getting towards uh, materials which are, um, again, up at a, a level that we would see as being uh, acceptable, 39, 40% plus. This gives us um, a modulus of around 78 gigapascals, ultimate tensile strength here of about 751 megapascals. But this is based purely on this uh, unidirectional eight-ply uh, structure based on reclaimed carbon. So this moves us into the more sustainable systems. This is a, a natural fiber composite, and you can see 
we've got a variety of materials that we might use. We've explored uh, jute, kanaf, karaya, and flax in this case. As you can see, they're very, very different in the way they present themselves, uh, very different manufacturing challenges, uh, very different range of mechanical properties. And as you can see, depending on what you're, what you're looking for here, um, you can have a material where you can maybe exemplify a high elongation, in case of kanaf with this uh, fairly porous structure. Or in our case, we tend to go with flax because we're maximizing the modulus and the strength. Uh, we compromise a little on the elongation uh, strain, but you can still see the materials give us uh, the best mechanical properties. How do we determine their uh, applicability to the fiber? Well, this fiendish um, my, um, micro droplet test is produced, a very steady hand required here to produce a single bead of resin on, the on a single fiber. This is then drawn through a micro vise and a, a basically a measurement is made of the energy required to debond this, um, this, uh, this bead of fiber and move it along the, the fiber. So we look at the energy required to decouple it from the fiber. So this is a, a, a piece of work that's being carried out uh, in conjunction with uh, North Sales. Uh, so uh, North Sales and uh, uh, the um, uh, Ocean Family Foundation. This is looking at uh, producing, reducing materials using pyrolysis and superheated steam um, and um, producing materials with a high retention of modulus, as you can see here, um, with a very much more highly aligned um, final material on the, um, uh, on the 3G material, on the 3G uh, hyperdiff. So we're moving towards manufacturing. Uh, we have produced the same filaments. In this case, it's a thermoplastic filament uh, which is then rolled into a square uh, structure. So we essentially fold the tape into a, uh, an oblong structure, which is then passed through a circular die. And that then produces a structure which can be uh, examined as a 3D printing composite. So as you can see, fairly complicated, complex structures being produced here with a, uh, a form where we're beginning to uh, produce an aerofoil structure here and multiple layers of the structure can be built up. Uh, and this gives us a reinforced composite that can be printed. So we're now moving towards a much more uh, automated comp complex form of uh, manufacture. So moving uh, on to uh, forming trials, well, the ability of the tapes to move slightly within the uh, structure relative to one another means that they form a net shape far more, um, far more um, uh, elegantly. And you can see here, this is a hyperdiff structure. Um, here it's a double diaphragm forming on um, a rugby, rugby or a hemispherical shape. As you can see here, there's a 090 structure using hyperdiff tapes with the corresponding continuous fiber. So same fiber, same matrix system, but simply uh, discontinuous versus continuous. You can see the, um, the, the aim is realistically to remove and reduce the wrinkling and also give us a far tighter distribution uh, so that the uh, net shape is far, uh, far, more, uh, far more true. And the final example I'll show you is coupling two um, Bristol spin-out technologies. So this is taking the hyperdiff uh, tape and combining it with um, not just automated fiber placement, but here continuous toe shearing. So this is taking the output from hyperdiff through Lineat composites and coupling that with ICOMAT, um, uh, led by uh, Eric Kim in this case. So just to, uh, to summarize, this is where we've gone. It's been a, quite a, a journey since 2012, a lot of activity, as you can see, large number of journal applications, conference presentations, a lot of uh, PhD student uh, uh, projects. We're now at the stage where Innovate and Set Squared funding has been used to, to spin out uh, Hyperdiff. And we are now in the form where Lineat Composites are, as we speak, uh, producing the, um, the, the production line, which will now start to produce far wider tapes, uh, up to uh, 100 millimeter width and uh, far higher production rates than we're capable of doing. So we acknowledge the funding from a range of different uh, places. We thank those, but of course, as a PI, it's always easy to stand up and uh, take the credit for what has been a large amount of uh, activity, a lot of research effort over a large uh, period of time. Um, the, um, the core team you see here with academics and postdocs, the current PhD researchers, 
but also numerous uh, PhD projects and uh, master's projects who have uh, contributed to this uh, very exciting journey. Thank you very much.